you didn't hang your uh, the cover as you said you were I, going to. I, I I don't want to respond be responsible for what that does to people. <laughs> All right. So um, Adrian Sanabria, he's an experienced security professional with nearly two decades of inter industry experience. Throughout his career, he's intentionally explored many different sides of the industry, starting in IT, quickly moved into security full-time as a practitioner, later moved into consulting, spent some time writing about the industry as an industry analyst, learned the business of the industry, helping investors and vendors build products, so now we know who to blame. Uh, some of my favorite work has been mentoring those starting their careers and helping to build support for practitioners in my local community. You do help with uh, B-Size Knoxville mm -hmm. and uh, you were present uh, last year at the Tactical Edge in Colombia. And today's session is uh, death to dwell time, which is something that we're all you know, familiar with uh, about uh, how long it takes for people to hack, blah, blah, you know, be on the network. So let's discuss that. So uh, Adrian, welcome. Thank you. Thanks for being here. So. Tell us about who you're working for, because that has to do a lot with your talk. Yeah, sure. Yeah, so I work for uh, Thinks Applied Research, which makes the uh, the canary. You know, if you've heard of canary, you know what it does. Uh, it's basically a honeypot that you put on your internal network to make sure, um, to let you know if somebody's doing uh, suspicious stuff in your network. And then we also make canary tokens, which do the same thing for you know, they can be anything from a Word document to something you put on a SQL server. Um, and, and they're just tripwires, they're traps to let you know that somebody's gotten into your environment. And it's always been an interesting topic to me. And that's, that's part of the reason why um, I was interested to join the company is because um, just not seeing a whole lot of progress there. And in the industry, you know, dwell time is, uh, it's not getting significantly better. Yeah, uh, according to your your description here, we're still talking hundreds of days before companies discover that they've been free. Yeah, um, with so many, you know, so many solutions in place out there, and and, and everyone in the industry talking about, you know, uh, identifying and and responding. How can that still be the case? Yeah, and it's. Um... I think it's kind of silly that we even track it as a metric because it's, it's uh, you know, I liken it to measuring how burnt the burned down house is. It's like, it's a total loss. Like it doesn't matter how close to carbon your, your belongings in your house got, it, it's burnt, you know, like <laughs> it's, it's, uh, it's a total loss. And I think the lowest I've seen it is 99 days on the, wow. on the Mandiant M trends report. And the highest has been like in the over a year, yeah. you know, over 400 days. And, and it's, it's just, it's useless. It's pointless at 99 days. What attacker, <laughs> even the dumbest attacker can like finish all their work in 99 days, you know, <laughs> like, how much time do you need? And that's the average, oh God, that's, that's the average. You know, we see it in the years, you know, it's, um, it's, it's, you know, it's a clear failure, you know, that we need to focus on as, uh, as an industry. So how, how do we, how do we fix that? I mean, you, you say here, how do we go from soft? What, what, what were your words here? How do we go from soft targets to prepare and aware the moment an attacker gets into our network? Take us through, because that's, that's going to be a process. So can you take us through that process? Yeah, so, so John's talk um, was a huge piece of it. You know, he talked about practicing, you know, and, and to me, you know, again, that's something where if you take anything else you want to be good at, you know, whether it's dance or sports or speaking a language or, um, you know. Speaking a language, like, how's your Spanish going, by the way? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, yeah, not, not well, not well. I was actually going to answer in Spanish and, and even that I was afraid I'd screw it up. <laughs> um, uh, prepare preparation. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, how, how can we expect to do well, uh, when a breach occurs, when we never practice at it, you know, mm -hmm. like, like what, what are the PCI requirements once a year? Yeah. You know, and then how in depth, how useful is that, 
uh, incident response test. You know, it's typically something that's like, like I wouldn't even consider it a test. You know, what, what most companies do, they just, you know, yeah, we had a thing that happened last week. We'll, we'll call that our test. Right. Yeah. Like John calls it a happy path, right? It's like, yeah, the antivirus will detect it. Yeah. Uh, so, it. yeah, of, of course you suck at it. You, you don't practice. You know, it's, it's uh, I, I think most companies with decent, if you've got 10 or more people in your security department, there's no excuse to not be practicing uh, weekly, you know, at least monthly. Keeping, you know, keeping your skills sharp yeah. um, and learning how to properly use the systems that you have in place, the defense solutions that you have. In exactly. Place. Exactly. And, and we see that in almost every case. So I, I started a company a, a while back called Savage Security. And our goal was just to figure out what we could do to make this easier on, on defenders. You know, how can we make it easier for you to be able to do the basics and for you to set up everything correctly? And one of the first things we would do for, for our clients is we would do a baseline. We would look at their vulnerability scanner. We would look at their security tools, their firewalls, and just get on a WebEx and walk through uh, the, the configurations on them and test them and see if they're actually working. And almost 100% of the time, just stuff is broken left and right all over. We, we found one company, uh, their, their web app scan, they're scanning 14 websites and only one domain name was spelled correctly. Oh. <laughs> the other 13 domain names, they forgot the M in .com. You know, it was just like a copy paste thing where somehow the M in .com got left off the other 13 out of the 14 websites. And so they're like, yeah, you know, our, our vulnerability scanner results are really good. We don't know why we get beat up on these pen tests. Yeah. I see, You're not I see scanning John, 13 of your 14 websites. I see John writing this one down. What if you forget to put the M in dot com? Oh my God, that is. It, 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 it's, it's amazing. And it's, I, I mean, part of the problem is we try to do everything, right? Like we, we're, security is so huge. Like, have you ever seen that CISO diagram, that mind map? Like, here's all the things a CISO worries about, yeah. you know, and it's like a thousand things that branch yeah. out in all directions. Um, and what that leads to is, yeah, I'm going to spend 20 minutes to set up my firewall, five minutes to set up my vulnerability scan, you know, with, with no double check, with no, no due diligence on, you know, make sure that it's set up correctly. And, uh, and these half measures, you know, of course they're all going to fail, you know, how about, famous, how about the famous stuff on the firewall that you see the first 10 or 15 rules and then the, the, the third rule after the next page is uh, permit any enemy, uh, yeah. right? Uh, it's like, what do you do in that case? I mean, you, you're wide open. And as you said, if you don't practice, if you don't ask yourself those questions, how are you gonna force yourself to go ahead and review that? Yeah. You're, you're in a happy place. Everything is perfect. And, and a great, great tweet uh, quote from Charlie Miller on this, where he likes to say that when you're an attacker, it's obvious when you fail, because you, you don't steal the data, you don't get into the network. But when you're a defender, it's not obvious when you failed. It's only obvious when somebody else tests it. <laughs> if, so if you're not testing it yourself, when an adversary is the first one to test whether or not you've done it right, you know, yeah, you, you've you've passed that off to them. You know, now the, you know the, uh, you know the ransomware folks or the, you know the the cyber criminal is going to test your security for you because you didn't bother to validate it. Mm. You didn't validate the, that those controls actually work. So that's why I actually got really excited about the breach and attack simulation market. You know, like Safe Breach and Veridin and uh, uh, Attack IQ, all those guys. So I was like, finally, like finally, we've got a market that's um, that's going to focus on actually testing these controls and letting you know when they're broken. Because uh, like pen tests don't really focus on that. You know, they just focus on getting in. So Really, I, I think even the consulting world needs to take uh, take a step back here and say, you know, maybe before we do a pen test, let's just run through your controls and see if they work first. You know, how about that? How about? <laughs> Is it, but isn't that what audits do? Uh, they should. I, I've I've not really seen them do that though. You know, typically yeah. the kind of checklist you have on an audit, you know, isn't really comparing the config against the results. You know, it it. it it goes, you know, it's still like a step away from actually valid doing that validation in a live environment. 
So like, uh, you know, one thing I get excited about uh, also is, um, you know, there's this open source tool called Infection Monkey. And it acts like a piece of ransomware, uh, but there's no malicious payload. So you can just let it loose in your environment, see what happens. Isn't that what Netflix uses? Something similar to what Netflix does, Chaos Monkey? Yeah. Well, yeah. So they, they have a whole suite of like a dozen or more, two dozen tools uh, that, that are just meant to, to, to break things in, in all sorts of different ways. And one of those dozen or two dozen tools is, is Chaos Monkey. Yeah. Uh, but I think they call it Simeon Army. You know, so they, they, it's, a whole, it's a whole ape and monkey theme that they have. And uh, yeah, like, like some of them are, are just shoving tons of traffic, right? You know, just doing load testing. Yeah. You know, other ones are doing more security tests. Some of them will just uh, randomly take systems down to see, see what fails, see if, the, uh, see if the generator comes on, you know? Like, <laughs> see if the, the cutover happens. Um, one of the most impressive customers I ever saw back in my consulting days uh, would actually switch to their DR environment for an entire week, every quarter. Wow. And then they would switch back to production, which is the real test of your DR plan. Not just does DR work, but how do you get back to production from DR? So they, edge, man. their confidence was like 100% <laughs> on their DR plan because they actually did it. They actually threw that switch you know, they're based in their main data centers in Ohio and they're throwing everything over to St. Louis. Um, and they do it on the weekend. Like I think Sundays, it's a retail company. Their stores are closed on Sunday. Uh, you know, so they, they had the luxury of doing that maybe. Um, but um, yeah, yeah, they do it once a quarter and, and they know their DR works. They know their plan works. And it's the same for security. You know, if, if, if you don't actually throw it into, uh, you know, production into a real test every now and then, you know, and, and it, it's so funny that nobody lets you do that, right? Like, yeah. you're not going to, you're not going to test that in production. What if something breaks? Well, then I'd rather know right now than at <laughs> 2 a.m. like when I'm on vacation, you know, yeah, right? In a controlled environment, control situation. Uh, all right, let's assume that uh, the company has come in, they hired Mr. Sanabria and you tested all the controls and found some things, blah, 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 and everything is tip top. Uh, what's next? How, how do, as, if they're gonna break, somebody's gonna break. How do you detect? Yeah, so that's, um, I think that's part of the testing you do before you do like a red team or a pen test or something like that. And, and then at that point, when, when everything's configured correctly, then you start testing the people. You know, so those are just the tools. Okay. You know, so yeah, next step is like in Target, in the case of Target, I think uh, there are six different times when their tools saw the attack, but the people didn't respond. You know, somebody from a FireEye call center calls up Target and says, hey, you know, you got a problem. And they did nothing. You know, the, like, like the people process broke. You know, so that, that's the point where, yeah, it's great to have these tools, but, you know, when somebody's looking that alert in the face and they're like, eh, swipe, <laughs> ignore, yeah. snooze. No, my problem um, is that it's one of those uh, fake positive or negative positive, whatever you call yeah. it. Um, Again, so, Equifax had everything they needed, yeah. uh, but the tools were broken. They, they, they left their tools in a broken state or they didn't know how to use them properly, but they owned all the tech and security oh, stuff they needed. Absolutely. To both prevent the attack and detect the attack. Okay. How with with things can already have or with your company right now, how, how are you breaching that or how are you helping yeah. that aspect? So, you know, we, we just we make a device like like this canary device here is just uh, it's a small hardware device. We also have a, a virtual version and a um, cloud version of this. And you just set it up and configure it like a Windows system or, uh, you know, a Mac, an IBM mainframe, uh, a Cisco multifunction copier scanner. Like we've got all these different personalities. And you just let it sit there and you wait for someone to try and log into it, to mess with it. And, and, and there is some strategy. And, and, and it's interesting, even though this thing takes three minutes to set up and put on your network. Um, a lot of our customers still don't have a lot of confidence uh, in, in where to put it. How many do they need? Where do they need to put them? 
so, so we, we find often uh, we're, we're providing that advice to them, you know, the, the strategies, you know, and, and a lot of it's just the, the thinking, you know, that, that uh, we need to practice that more, that these tabletops, like John talks about, you know, like, like you were saying, like, I don't see the point of this until you actually get into it and you're like, ah, yeah, no, I, no, I get it. These are hard decisions, you know? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so, yeah, those are the kinds of things that you need to do in addition to the tools to be able to use them effectively. Yeah, because what you just explained, you know, about 20 years ago or so, I worked for a company called Extreme Networks. And, and this was you know, a switching company, right? They were famous for making purpose. I remember, products. yeah. They had gone into cyber sec into security, and they came out with a product that was exactly what you just said. You just put them in the in, in the network, and it would um, uh, appear like if it was a Windows uh, XP or a Windows 95 in those days. And uh, they used a technology called negative ARP that will actually or poison ARP poison that will actually poison the. <laughs> The, uh, the, the, the attacker that was getting into the honeypot. But again, that was technology that was, I would say 20 years old. Um, yeah. I'm surprised Thinkionary is doing something like that. Aren't there more companies doing that? I mean, you know, did, did, did the industry forget about that type of solution? I think they did. I think they did. In fact, bef uh, right when we started coming out with these, uh, Haroon Mir, the founder, yeah. uh, did a talk that that's still still a good good talk to watch called uh, "Bring Back the Honey Pots." And what they found, and the reason that uh, we created the pro product, is because you know companies knew it was useful uh, in, in most cases, but it was just too much work to maintain and to set up, and so that's. Honestly, all, all our innovation is around just making it very simple. You know, and there's zero management overhead, no false positives, three minutes per device to set up, and you just forget about it and, and wait to get those alerts. So it's just, um, and, and I think that's a lot of security is that the basics aren't easy. Like a lot of these mm -hmm. vendors are more focused on cramming in every feature that every customer asks for than just, just making it manageable. You know, like how many people do you need to, to get value out of a SIM in, in, a, in a mid sized enterprise? Yeah. Way too many, way, yeah. way, way too many. Absolutely. You know, it, it needs to be, we, we've got to balance that out where, you know, maybe, you know, we, we don't go crazy with the features and give the customer, you know, every crazy scenario that they're asking for. And first we just make sure it works, you know, and people can, uh, configure it correctly and maintain it because what we found when we were doing that consulting is nobody was configuring their their products successfully. Well, so so you you have you and I have spoken before. Uh, we had a web a uh, long time ago about basics of all, all the tools that Windows 10 comes with on the security basics. And yeah. and you were in in this conversation and you've done it in, you've done workshops and everything on this. It's like all the tools are there. You just need to enable it. Um, yeah. Why aren't people enabling it? Because they don't know about it. Because they're lazy and they don't want to know about it. I mean, what's 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 the issue here? So, yeah, mainly it's they don't know about it. Is Microsoft has added all these tools so quickly, but M Microsoft isn't marketing these built-in tools and features the same way that the rest of the industry is marketing their products. Because uh, for, and that's changed now, you know, Microsoft has their Defender ATP and they actually have a lot of products that they are charging for now. So people are more aware now than they used to be. But, um, but yeah, generally I've found pe people don't realize it's there. They don't realize they can do these things with the, you know, what just comes out of the box. And that's why you don't see, I, I, I don't know if it's just a split in how, you know, Linux admins, Unix admins, and Windows admins think, because I think traditionally Unix admins would use a larger percentage of the tools that come with the product than, than maybe Windows admins do. I don't know, maybe that's just my bias, you know, but, but my experience, like I started out working in ISPs, doing ISP tech support, and, and the Unix admins I knew there, you know, really had their systems locked down. Like that was very important to them to, to harden the system and, they knew how to use all the security tools, how to test their own security, 
And I, I just don't find that. I've never found that as much with Windows admins. So may, maybe it's the, the approach, you know, the operating system didn't really encourage that as much yeah. in the past. Yeah, who knows? So, I mean, so, so the basics, I mean, what, what, what other basics in, in, you know, in cybersecurity and protection do, do, do you think is there? It's something that it's, it's not, first it's often basic from a technical perspective, uh, other than, you know, doing the, um, the, this tabletop exercises and, and making you think what else can they, can, can people do? Um, what devices are out there that you've seen in your, exp in your experience that could be configured a little bit better if they just enable some default settings? And then it begs the question, if, 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 if the default settings fix the security, why the freaking don't they come enabled by default? <laughs> right, yeah. Yeah, so, you know, we, we, we in, in the last talk, we talked about the, you know, the IoT law in California now requires that out of the box. And, um, and yeah, like with Microsoft, like there, there's so much low hanging fruit, like not having the same admin password across the entire infrastructure. You know, Microsoft has a tool for that. You know, you can use, oh, really? yeah, you can use laps uh, to, to make sure that you've, you've randomized admin passwords across, across all the machines. And then, uh, you know, understanding how pass to hash works, how to, how to detect it, mitigate it, what event IDs to look at, you know, that your, your SIM should be, should be popping up and telling you. You know, just basic stuff like making sure you get the alert when somebody manually turns off the antivirus service on a workstation. <laughs> like somebody just does a net stop semantic, you, you should know, you know, because your antivirus will send you an alert when that happens. Uh, and you can get an alert out of uh, Windows. You know, there'll be an event ID for that service stop. You know, there's three or four different ways you can be alerted about this happening. And a hundred percent of the time you want to know when somebody manually turns off an, an AV service, a lot of ransomware is doing that uh, before it downloads the malicious payload. But so it's funny because you, because you go, you go back to, for example, uh, Tripwire, right? Tripwire is, is basically to, to keep an eye on how your configuration is. And if it changed and it wasn't authorized, right? To raise an alarm. I mean, that's been around for what, 10 years, 15 years. Uh, it's in the late 90s. Imagine that. Yeah. Why are we still talking about that as being a basis, basic? Well, you know? again, again, it's because it's <laughs> nobody's testing it. No, nobody's running through, you know, the whole, like, like, like imagine, imagine if football teams never took to the field and practiced, like, like it was all on paper, like, like they would just go yeah. through all the plays on paper. Yeah. And, and the first time they ever stood on the field, was during a game, you know? <laughs> it's, that, that's where we've been for the last 20, 30 years is, is yeah. the only practice we get is the real event where we're in trouble. Yeah, and, and it's funny that you use that, that example because when I was doing my certification to become a certified soccer coach or my licenses, one of the stories that they told us was about this famous coach, uh, uh, Ferguson from Manchester United, that he came into the training room one day and he saw his assistant, you know, and all the players around a, like a little table, tabletop, a soccer tabletop. And he's like, what the hell are you doing? And he's like, no, I'm showing the players how they need to move, you know, the, the strategy, how they need to move on the field. And the story goes that Ferguson went ahead and zip <laughs> everything in the ground. Flipped the table. <laughs> and they're like, what the hell you do that for? He goes, the other team showed up. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> right. The other two showed up. You gotta be out there in the field practicing. You gotta be out there running, feeling what it feels like. Yeah. Uh, so that way you get that instinct and you know, you know how to react in that moment. Well, it's I mean, exactly the same thing here. Yeah. And again, like like you shouldn't even have to refer to your incident response plan. How many companies even know where it is? Well, that company, companies? Spain, that company in Spain that didn't know. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> like like. I, I'm pretty sure we have one. Where is it? You know, <laughs> it's let, let me unplug everything and turn off everything while we're going to look for the incident response point. Yeah. Like, like you should practice that thing so often you shouldn't even need to refer to it unless you need like a, you know, the phone number, your or contact information for your local FBI or, or but law Adrian, enforcement. how many, how many companies do you know in your, in your history as a consultant, have you seen companies that do this on a weekly basis? 
or on a monthly basis? How many? None. None. We, we used to joke the only way to get them to take it seriously, and, and it wasn't 100%, like I told you about the one that would flip to their DR once every quarter. Um, but nine out of 10, we used to joke we needed a service where we would g just go and breach them, you know, so they finally take it seriously. Like, it was just really difficult to get companies to take it seriously uh, unless something bad actually happened, unless they were forced to. So again, we, we get back to that you know, unless it's regulation, like uh, they're required, like legally required to do it. Well, we were uh, talking before with with uh, with and Andrea about the uh, mm -hmm. the regulation, the basic, you know, things that you have to do. Uh, yeah, you, we can't wait for that. Companies cannot yeah. wait for that. To two, happen. yeah. So two things: e either you're required to do it, and they they have to take it seriously, or people in leadership uh, think it's important enough that they make it happen. Those are the only only two ways I've seen it happen. And, and do you think it's a, it's a fear factor that, uh, that that they fear that they're going to show, you know, we're not doing what we're supposed to be doing? We're yeah, be... I, I can't tell how many pen tests. And, and it's weird, like on in, in the smaller company size, like small to mid size, mm -hmm. uh, you know, once you're under like 3000, 2000 employees, you know, 50 million in revenue. Like they, they say, yeah, tell me all the bad stuff. I, I want to know. But then once you get above that, you've got these huge layers of middle management <laughs> that, that are so afraid of sending anything up that, that looks bad. You know, I, I, I've, I've worked in companies and talked to pen testers who like most of their time is spent battling like, should this be a, you know, they want to make this a medium, but it's a high. You know, they want me to change the severity on, on, on this report because it's going to make them look bad. So, so yeah, you, you've got this whole, you know, and, and there's lots of books where you can read about, you know, how toxic middle management can, can get and all these, all these examples where companies failed and the people at the top said, oh, I didn't know. I didn't know how bad it was. Like, I shouldn't go to jail. I didn't even know about it. <laughs> right. And, and that's where I go, right, with the conversation with Andrea. It's like, holy crap. How are you, how are you going to put regulations where you're going to go to jail for negligence? How are you going to prove negligence uh, in, in, in our industry? It's, uh, it's, it's, it's pretty, it's pretty interesting. And, so, and honestly, uh, it's like why, why HR exists and middle management exists is to protect the, uh, the executives from all the, all the shady stuff that goes on. To, <laughs> to, to make things done. work. <laughs> I never thought of that. You know, um, when I was at a previous company and we were talking to a very large international bank, uh, this is the first time that I heard that. And it's similar to what you just said, right? Uh, if, and I don't know if you knew this, right? So, so banks have a, a rating, right? A star rating, all right? And, and basically, if you, do, if you do a risk assessment or, or you do a vulnerability assessment, pen testing for a bank, usually the risk officer does not accept the report because if they accept it, now they have to act on it because by law they have to report that. And they report it to the overall organization that gives the ratings to all the banks. So middle management holds up to the reports and then they make the decisions, which goes what you just said, right? Now, why why do we have middle management and best to protect those people from from making those decisions as a, as a buffer? So they can say, I never saw the report. So yeah. you cannot ding us, you know, um, you cannot remove the ratings from a four-star rating bank to a three-star because that will cost us billions of dollars. So it's ridiculous to me. That was ridiculous that the way that you deal with that risk is you ignore it. Yeah, and, and, and that's, that's a huge issue in company culture that, that just has to be, has to be removed. And, and outside of cybersecurity, we've seen it, you know, so much fraud and embezzlement and uh, things like that happen where, um, you know, that, that's enabled by that kind, of, that kind of culture where, you know, like, like I've heard stories of, uh, you know, putting in security devices that give them visibility into what employees are doing you know, that then opens them up to all kinds of uh, federal and civil issues. You know, like, uh, you know, one story was uh, they found employees uh, collecting or, or serving up child porn from internal systems, hmm. you know, it turned into this big issue, you know, uh, federal investigation, you know, it took two years to clean it up. 
And the lesson learned from that is is to rip out WebSense so they they don't know when that happens again. <laughs> <laughs> oh my God. That's, that's kind of the opposite direction, uh, the whole idea. All right, uh, tell us, uh, if you can, um, let's turn to Darknet Diaries here. Tell us if you can a story, uh, a successful story, where you guys came in and uh, usually we, you guys are usually going to come in after uh, an incident happened, right? So it doesn't happen again. So tell us a story, uh, you know, if you can when you came in and you put in your solution in place and you demonstrated that you did detect and, and that you notified the client faster that they were in a, under a breach. Yeah, so, so honestly, um, it's not, not terribly exciting. It's not a specific story, <laughs> but the best time, you know, we, we tell customers uh, to do a proof of concept or, or to try the product is right before a pen test. You know, because, oh, okay. you know, for years, you know, most companies are used to the pen tester coming in and, and you know, like, like first 10 minutes, the pen tester has domain admin, you know, that like they're making everybody look bad. They, they drop off this huge report afterwards, you know, now with a, you know, with a, with a product like this, like in the first 10 minutes, they, they know when the pen testers happen, they know exactly where the pen testers at, what they're doing, what they're touching. You know, they, all of a sudden they've got all this visibility. It, it, they kind of get to, to turn the tables on them. You know, I, I did a podcast a little while back and, and he d described it as getting their smugness back. <laughs> <laughs> oh my but but that, that's, a, that's a story we hear over and over and over. Like uh, uh, clients love catch, busting their pen testers, catching their, yeah, their pen testers. Um, but yeah, yeah, it catches real attacks too. Like one of the most interesting things is just turning on port scanning detection on one of these canaries. Uh, immediately, a lot of customers uh, ha have no clue all the things that are scanning in their environment. You know, so they're running around trying to figure out like that. That's not our vulnerability scanner. Why is this thing? Why is this thing scanning the network? Okay, so it identifies uh, anomaly traffic. Uh, okay. Uh, David Townsend. David Townsend makes a good comment here. He says that's an excellent way to keep a pen tester honest. <laughs> yeah. So, so good point. Uh, like three or four months ago, we had a customer call in and tell us, "Hey, you know, thanks for the product. We found out our pen test was supposed to end on Friday, uh, but they continued on Monday, and we wouldn't have known about it if not for for the uh, you know for the canary." And we asked them to stop. <laughs> Oh, because that happens all the time. Like pen testers, like there, there's always one more thing you want to try and crack, right? As, <laughs> as, as a pen tester, yeah. you know, and, and, and they'll, they'll try and sneak around the, the engagement window and, and finish that up. And sometimes that'll break things. That's why we have that engagement window, yeah. you know, that's but, funny. but that's yeah, funny. yeah, that's happened. So, so we're talking about, yeah, let's talk about people, right? Uh, because, okay, so everything that technology is going to break people. How, how does Canary or uh, this, this solution or solution similar to that, how does it help with the people process of the people issue? It doesn't. It, it makes it a little bit easier to, I, I, I mean, well, it, it does in one big way in that you can get false positives down to nearly zero. So when you can trust one source of information, um, you know, that anytime it sends you an alert, uh, you, you need to do something with that alert. That's something that you need to go point. chase down. Okay. Uh, that's a big issue I see with a lot of other products in the industry. Traditionally, uh, WAF, IDS, SIM, all these products, uh, the false positive rate is so high, uh, you know, that, that's, that's probably why Target did nothing when they got the alerts. Exactly. You know, is, okay. is uh, that alert fatigue, they're just, uh, they're so used to getting alerts from it. Uh, th there's no way you can pull out the positive ones. I, I had a company once tell me that they got 180,000 DLP alerts daily. <laughs> so, when, so, so when they get a call, they like they, they say, "Oh, thank, like, bye, thank, thank you." Mm -hmm. And someone at some point in the company, some executive, knows that they paid for DLP, right? Mm -hmm. So they're thinking, "You can't exfiltrate anything from my network," mm -hmm. you know. And, and someone somewhere else is choosing not to tell them, "No, this is so broken, we would never know." Yeah, yeah, exactly, exactly, because too much noise in there. Uh, I knew a company that uh, that we were doing uh, a missed CSF on them, uh, and then uh, we asked them about you know you have a threat intelligence. You know, oh yes, you know, 
and they're like, we use this one from, from this big company. And we're like, all right, how many analysts do you have in place? Well, analysts? <laughs> <laughs> no, we wrote, we wrote a, a little thing, you know, of the cow that, that, that will take that, that, that pipe and it will look for specific and then it will send us the information. I'm like, how many alerts do you get then out of that little program? Well, about like 10,000. I'm like, a day? No, about an hour. <laughs> I'm like, <laughs> yeah. yeah, you're not going to do anything with it. So, so why, you know, why, why even bother? Uh, but again, it's part of your, you know, checklist. Yep, I got a threat intelligence uh, yeah. uh, system in place solution. And and again, that's that's where closing that feedback loop is super important. Doing the test and saying, hey, I, I just created a domain admin by the name of Hacky McHackerface, and and nobody's screaming, like like nobody nobody noticed. That's a problem. Let's, let's fix that. You know, so that's, that's again, going back to John, that's where uh, it's so important to practice uh, so that you have this one-to-one -one, like, like, and some do it with your pen test. You know, mm -hmm. I think that's where like a purple team assessment comes into play here is uh, take it step by step. You know, the pen tester gets one level of access, uh, stops, tells you so that you can figure out why you didn't see it, why you didn't know about it fix that. Okay, let's move to the next step. You know, or maybe do the entire assessment and then go to them and say, here, here's, here's the full list of things I was able to do, the systems I was able to get in. Uh, let's look at your systems and see why, why you didn't stop me, why you didn't notice. Mm. Oh, absolutely, absolutely. And, and, and doing that. So yeah, so, so going back to why it takes so long to discover a breach, is because of that. It's too much, too much information coming in that it's not enough time to analyze and to make a good, uh, good decision. So usually by default, as in the target example you're using, the, the telltale signs have been captured, but nobody can read through the notice. And it's because of that, that then until something really bad happens that when you, when you realize. So you have the information from day one, you just didn't know anything about it until your, you know, your network will shut down and every, everyone has ransomware. Yeah, I mean, having the information, you know, is, is great, but that doesn't mean that you know it, right? Like, like have, having, you know, and it's important to have a lot more data than you'll ever need because you don't know what you're going to need. So it, it, it's dangerous to kind of filter out, you know, stuff mm -hmm. where you don't even get it anymore. But it's important to separate the actionable inform information from the, uh, you know, uh, information that you might need, the anecdotal information, you know, so, you know, I've never used switch logs before, you know, like telling me ports are up or down, but I could absolutely see scenarios where I want to know when somebody plugged into that port in that conference room. Uh, <laughs> and it might not be until a year later that I need that information, yeah. you know, that I'm doing that investigation. And that's when that person in we know they went to that conference room and sat down. Let's see if they plugged into that to that switch. Yeah, that's a well, that's a lot of stuff in there. Um, I heard a story a, lot, a while ago, I forgot where, but it was about a, uh, a public company, like a power company, utility company that was hacked, um, and the hackers uh, took control to do crypto mining, right? Yeah. And then, and then they came in and did a pen test, or they put one of your devices or something, and they they realized what was happening. So they started doing an investigation. And then they, I oh know that the, the way that they found out is like, um, they, some company issued a patch, a critical patch. So then their IT system went to patch and they realized that the system was already patched and they didn't remember patching. So they're like, what the hell? So, so they started investigating, they started investigating. And then they went back and they said, well, this was patched on such and such a date. And then the pen tester came in and did everything and they're like, and you got you got people in your network and they're crypto mining. What happened is that these hackers uh, they didn't want they were having such a great time and a lot of you know a lot of power that they were using for the crypto mining. They didn't want any other hackers to take over. Yes, yeah. they, they ended up patching and securing the, the that network uh, for the client so that nobody else could take over. So yeah. when the client when when the client told the pen test, oh, the pen tester said, "Well, okay, so we're going to shut him down." The client goes, "Whoa, whoa, whoa, no, 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 <laughs> keep, <laughs> keep him there." 
keep him there because they're doing such a great job securing our network. I almost act on that one. Dude, that is so funny. But you know, a lot of a lot of companies are not that lucky. You're not gonna find and, and and that's not the first time I've heard a story like that either. <laughs> like the the Mirai botnet, you know, some of that went on where, you know, all of a sudden they're very there are competing versions of the of the botnet. You know, and, and to you know, it became king of the hill. Like you had to actually close Telnet at some point. You had, you had to close, you know, the the door you came in through. Right. Otherwise, somebody else would come in and kill your process and kick you off. <laughs> exactly. So, but that goes back to you know that the story goes back to what you just said about keeping you know uh, the basics right. If somebody makes a change, it updates or stops a service, you should get a message that tells you. Yeah. These people should have gotten a message that my server was just freaking updated. I mean, yeah. come on, that's uh, that should be a big, uh, you know. Well, and, and, and so, so the problem there is that nobody's classifying that as a suspicious action. Like, like nobody's looking at their at their at their patch logs. You know, and half the people with Tripwire, you know, uh, again, they're getting so many alerts, they're not really monitoring it. And, and, and that's the problem when you start off with the default recommendations of whatever tool, you know, mm -hmm. most of them, like, like I remember the first time we set up a SIM, the first thing we did is we told everything we had to shove its logs into that SIM. <laughs> yes, and, and before you knew it, we were pumping in, in 2004, we were pumping in a hundred million uh, events a day into the system and we didn't know what to do with any of it. Yeah. We were just, you know, just like the, skin melting off our faces for <laughs> getting all getting getting all the text messages is alert 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 yeah 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 it's it, and it's overwhelming and um yeah there's different ways to approach it you know so again you know start with a scenario you know that that you saw in the news or or that keeps you up at night or that you don't want to see happen run through that scenario and, and make sure that you saw that thing happen yeah that's a good idea that's yeah. great. So not, not only do that scenario in, in a tabletop exercise, but see if you can do it in your environment. I mean, again, with yes. some brains though, right? So yeah. you want to make sure that it's not going to shut your environment down, although you're saying, well, that's, that's the best time to do it. But, that's uh, what these breach and attack simulation tools do, is uh, some of them will actually hook into your sim and tell you whether or not they were able to see themselves do something. <laughs> They'll let you know, and they'll they'll even write the the sim rule for you. I think in some cases, wow, and and, and fix that for you. Say, hey, yeah, it's a problem that you didn't see me add an account on the system. Yeah, that's a huge problem. Exactly. Yeah. Uh, all right. Anything? Any other? Uh, how about uh, policies, documentation, procedures, and stuff like that? But do they come into play anytime? Because every time that we talk about, you know, if you do an ISO twenty seven thousand one, for example, mm -hmm. right? The first thing they're going to ask is policy, processes, and procedure. Yeah. Did, did, did this come into play into an environment that you went, you know, to minimize the time to acknowledge or identify that you can have? Yeah, I mean, I mean, that's just a that's a maturity thing, you know. And you have as the organization gets larger, you have to do those kinds of things. Otherwise, you know, it's just constant fires all day, every day, you know, you should be able to hire someone, just point them at a folder, tell them, you know, read these things and, and they understand what to do in an incident and, and how it's going to go, who's in charge. And it, like for incident response, one of the worst things is not knowing who's in charge, you know, because if you have more than one hero personality in, in the security organization, you know, they're, they're going to be running the same queries in the same system at mm -hmm. half the speed because they're both running it at the same time, you know, they're going to be stepping on toes. They're going to be giving conflicting uh, advice on what to do. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You're going to have people unplugging stuff from the internet. <laughs> <laughs> somebody, somebody needs to be in charge and, and yeah. you need to immediately know who's in charge and it needs to be somebody who's not going to, not going to panic. Okay. Uh, when you go to clients, do you ever tell them, you know, this is the, you know, you should aim, to know in X amount of days if you've been breached? It's so minutes. It's when I talk to most CISOs, you know, that most progressive CISOs that have, that have really been through breaches, and that's another point I want to make, like, like 
what's up with this trend of firing people with breach experience? <laughs> you know, it's like, like, like for some reason you think it's better to have someone who's never been through a breach in charge yeah. and they could, they could better prevent a breach. I would rather have somebody who's been through 10 breaches who, okay. who's, who's experienced that pain and As learned like all those honor. lessons, <laughs> you know, than, than somebody who never has. But, but they're the talking problem, about minutes. They they want to know in less than ten minutes. Well, yeah, they want to know, but 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 and they do get reality, really. Yeah. Wow. But we we're talking about a lot of investment into the uh, solutions, or or just tweaking what they already have. Well, they do that. They do that full loop. You know, they they practice. You know, they simulate the event, uh, and, and they make sure they can do it, and. Uh, Typically, there are organizations that are that are very targeted, you know. So they they get practice with real events on a regular basis, also. Okay. okay. Yeah, Let's and see. and so you know, at Thinkst we get these. Uh, sometimes we get a story, but more often than not, you know, it's just kind of like a like a wink, wink and a nod. You know, it's like, hey, your your product came in handy last weekend. It was a oh, long weekend. Well, you know, it's like, they kind of they they, they kind of do a disclosure at that point. Yeah. Exactly, but. Yeah, no, no, we, we've, uh, we've been doing it long enough to know what that, that wink and that nod that means. <laughs> how, how difficult then it is for Things Canary to come up with uh, yearly reports on, on this type of scenarios? Because you, you're very well positioned in a lot of companies to detect how quickly, you know, you're, you're detecting attacks and how quickly they're reporting on it. Yeah, you know, honestly, that's not, we, we've not really delved into that. I, I've asked the same questions. I've been very interested in, in maybe collecting that kind of data, but again, you have to be careful. Yeah, you know, yeah because obviously you have to get that paid from the clients, yeah. Obviously, like the whole goal with, um, with uh, detecting that kind of activity is you're stopping it before the breach occurs. Mm -hmm. And it, it, that can be very dangerous. Uh, you know, if people find out that an incident occurred but they don't feel like it got far enough that it became a breach, you know, and if that so gets it's not a breach. Yeah. yeah. So yeah. I, I've been interested in, in surveying customers. I, I, I want to know that myself, you know, that like, I, I want to know um, when our devices go off, how quickly they're able to contain and eradicate the, the, the intrusion. Mm. Cause that's, that's so, really, that that's part two of all this. You know, you, you've got to know about it first to be able to do anything. And then how quickly can you respond? You have automated playbooks set up. Like if you're up against ransomware, you have to move very quickly, you know, yes. because that's not somebody typing at a keyboard. That's fully automated code that, you, that you're racing against. So how do you go and fix that issue of too much information overload? How, how do you differentiate from your information that you're sending from the IPS or the WAN in a, in a company? That that's that's really the question, isn't it? That's um, again, it's it's separating that actionable in information from the anecdotal information. And I, I like to say, you know, we we have a hoarding problem in infosec where we're yeah. so scared mm -hmm. of of you know shoving away that noisy stuff, um, you know that that we we end up never seeing anything because you know we, we we're looking at too much. You know those ten thousand. You know the threat intel of ten thousand things a day. Mm -hmm. It's fine, or ten thousand things an hour. It's mm -hmm. fine that you're getting that, but you shouldn't have anybody just looking at that scrolling, a, a, you know, across a screen. That's gonna happen, yeah. Yeah, I mean, you got to figure out what your triggers are, and that's when we talk about like uh, where to put these devices. You know, you want you should have a general idea of where an attacker is going to come into your environment. You know, like like you should know. Yeah. Okay, we've got web apps, you know, they could come into this web DMZ. If it's an uh, internal issue, you know, it's going to come from a user subnet, something like that. Mm -hmm. uh, you should generally know where your attack surface is, is greatest. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. You know, and, and that's, that's where you want to have these alarms. That's where you want to have these, uh, these tripwires trigger. Mm. Interesting. Par pardon the pun. <laughs> no, no, that's pretty, that's pretty good. Uh, all right, man, I like, I'm, I'm, my brain is fried. Uh, yeah, if we have any questions, help me out because my brain is fried. John or Cheryl, if you're still connected. Yeah, you, you've been at this all day. I just all day, started. yeah. I'm like, I need a break. Uh, that's why I only did six. I, I was going to do the full eight hours. I'm like, no, 
good good choice good choice yeah <laughs> Uh, six is good. Yeah, so, so another point to throw out there, you know, I think again, uh, having the right mentality is is super important. Like uh, something I hear from vendors constantly that that drives me nuts is uh, the attacker only has to be right uh, once, and the once. yeah one time, and and the defender has to be right every time. And, and saying that suggests that somehow there's one thing the attacker can do, and they've stolen all your data, right? Like, no, it's a multi-step process. It's like, you know, Equifax took them, uh, I think several days, you know, to do the damage that they did, you know, and it was like a 16 step process. Uh, this past year, the Verizon DBIR actually had a whole section talking about how many steps it takes. Yeah, in a from, so uh, yeah. Each of those steps, that's an opportunity to detect and respond, detect and respond, detect and respond. Um, and, and I'd like to suggest a, a flip side to that, because when you think about it, attackers are flying blind when they come into your network. They don't know how your network's set up. They don't know the routing, the IP addresses. They don't know where the database servers are. You know, they're totally blind when they come in, right? Yeah. Like as a consultant, yeah. when, when you come in, you, you, have, you need, you know, you're going to request network diagrams, right? You want to sit down with, uh, you know, some of the IT staff and understand the, the network. Um, that's why our products work is because when the attacker gets in, they need to explore yeah, to, to find what they're looking for. That stuff, yeah. That's how, that's how our product works. That's how the, the alerting works. And um, so mess with your network, you know, <laughs> set it up where it's not what the, they'd expect, where, you know, change so, some of those defaults. So let me go back really quick because now my brain. What happens if RDP is, is no longer running on the, the default port for RDP. Will they even find it? <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Uh, so let me go back to that, uh, the Ryzen uh, DBIR report, because I remember very well that that graph it shows, right? The longer you put things in place, you know, the time uh, for them to actually execute, be successful in the bridge. I mean, it was a dramatic increase. It wasn't even you know, like, like a little bit. And then uh, my question was to the person that posted it, it's like, are we talking about putting more devices like a defense in depth, putting firewall, putting IPS and stuff like that? And the answer was is yes, putting more of these devices. And again, implemented defense in depth. For your devices, is that where you should be putting in whatever you have one of these defense in depth devices, boom, putting a canary in place also to listen? Uh, yeah, absolutely. Mm -hmm. that, that's when it starts to give you the most pre-bridge uh, alarms, right? It's like, why right. Have, yeah, why is this traffic coming and trying to hit my box when it should be going straight, you know, the regular path of the traffic, normal path should be going straight to this firewall or this device. It shouldn't be going up oh, right. to me all of a sudden. Yeah, so I mean, our, our device is never, is, un, unless it's an internal uh, issue, uh, our device is, is typically not going to be step one, you know, like, like they've already gotten into one thing and they're looking to pivot. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. That's when you hit a token that looks like a word doc with, with passwords in it, or you hit a canary that looks like a windows file server with uh, confidential documents. Right. Yeah. So going back to Cheryl's uh, conversation about, you know, putting the polycom, in the network environment, you will probably create a VLAN only for this type of devices, right? And then you already know the type of communication that these devices are gonna have. This polycom should not be talking laterally. So if you put one of the canaries in that VLAN and make it look like a really easy target, all of a sudden you start getting hits from this IP address to this one, boom. Right there, you have an alert, uh-oh, something's going on and it should be really right. quick, there shouldn't be zero questions exactly yeah yeah there, there's zero valid reason for somebody to be accessing this system it, it doesn't have to even be a special vlan it can be you know wherever you put a canary it's 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 a system that has no valid use for okay. for people that work there yeah here's a nice question someone that seems to have experience with uh, with your solutions um uh, if i put a canary token on a file share how do I keep normal users from accessing it and setting it off by accident? 
Yeah, yeah. So one trick is just put it in a hidden file or folder. If group policy, you know, or, or your gold image uh, has hidden files and folders uh, hidden for users, um, yeah, that, that's a good way to do it because most attacker tools don't care if you've got the hidden flag flipped on, you know, like, like they're going to find it regardless. Uh, the attacker may not even, they may specifically seek out hidden files and folders, uh, whereas your, your users wouldn't see that. You know, so that, yeah, that, and those are the, that's the kind of strategic thing you have to think about with the, with the tokens. Uh, generally, that's not an issue with the network canaries, but with the, the tokens, because they're files, you have to get a little bit more creative in, in where you put them to make sure you don't get false positives. Very nice. All right. Uh, I think we've reached uh, our time limit here. I know I have physically and mentally. <laughs> uh, so everyone, uh, thank you for joining us. Uh, all the uh, presenters, uh, the three that are left here, Adrian, John, and Cheryl, thank you so much for spending uh, Saturday with us. Everybody else, thank you so much for, for attending and looking forward to seeing you on the next set of, uh, of, of events. We're probably gonna have a few more of this during the year. This was pretty successful, I liked it. So again, thanks everyone. We'll uh, we'll stay in touch. Yeah, thank you. And no.